Welcome. My name is Terry Drew Karanen. This is the third talk in my four-part series on the basics of science of mind, as developed and taught by Reverend Dr. Ernest Holmes. In the first talk, we learned about this force, the thing itself, as Holmes refers to it. It is the all-powerful, everywhere present, and non-judgmental consciousness, which is totally impartial. Omnipresence, being everywhere and everything simultaneously, or oneness, that's a challenging concept for us on the physical plane, but it is also unlimited power. The second week we talked about the way it works and the way it works is through us. That's a different idea than God can doing something than God doing something for us. Holmes said, God can do nothing to us that it does not do through us. The basis for its work is our belief, our faith in that power. Without faith, we'll never manifest the type of life we want or have the things that we wish to enjoy. The law never fails to work, but it is only working at our level of acceptance. And that brings us to part three, what it does. We approach this study of the science of mind in a scientific and rational manner. While infinite, infinite mind knows all there is to know, this intelligence can acquaint us with its ideas only as we are able and willing to receive them. The secrets of the universe are out there just waiting to be let loose, but it must have an outlet. What we draw from it, we must draw through the channel of our own minds. The divine knowingness becomes our intelligence only in such degree as we embody its intelligence. It has been said that we can know God only insofar as we can become God, but it will tell us only what we can understand. We don't attempt to explain calculus to a person who can't count. The difference is, though, that it may take a ye years for a person to get to a point where they can understand advanced mathematics, but we can move spiritually just as quickly as we are willing to move based on the consciousness we have developed up until now and continue to build upon. It is not just desire, but the willingness to change our thinking, habits, and attitudes. Holmes wrote, or wrote rather, the universe is impersonal. It is no respecter of persons. That means it is going to work the same for me as it does for you. We are the ones who allow it to work. There is no resistance on God's part. To allow God to work in our lives, Ralph Waldo Emerson advised that we get our bloating nothingness out of the way of divine power. Those who think too much of themselves, the arrogant ones that scripture calls those puffed up with pride, they will not receive the simplicity of fate, faith rather, yet the pure in heart see God. The farmer sees the heavenly host in the fields. The infant frolics with God as it plays with its toes. The mother has clasped God to her breast as she nurses. The fond lover has seen God in the eyes of their partner. We look far too far, <laughs> we look far too many times away from the reality of God. About this, Holmes said, we have made a riddle out of simplicity. Therefore, we have not read the sermons written in stones, nor interpreted the light of love running through life. To return to a sane simplicity of the reality of life is one of the first and most important things to do. That may seem elementary, very simple, but simple is not always easy. We live today in a world where industrialized first world nations have made life very complicated. It's not easy to get a straight answer to questions you want answered. If you don't believe that, try calling the IRS, the offices in, of your city government, or most utility companies. Before I make those calls, I always treat that the person I speak with has the answers I need, or at least knows where to get them. I get my questions answered, but in the process, I normally talk to a minimum of three or four people, or work my way through a seemingly endless submenus of a voicemail system. It does us good occasionally to step back from our lives and do a reality check. How complicated do we want our lives to be? Are there areas we can make simpler with less stress? We will not eliminate all stress in our lives. 
We wouldn't want to since some stress is beneficial for our existence. But we also do not want to add to the stress of our lives by living complicated, rigid lives just because so much of our world does that. The study of metaphysics, religious science, and the science of mind are like any other course of study or ex area of expertise. They each have a language all its own. We use terms which are not commonly used in daily language of people on the street. We use commonly used words in a new and different way. Words have the power and meaning we assign to them. But with words comes the temptation to talk ourselves out of any situation or challenge without really dealing with the issues that cause them. In our terminology, I call that metaphysical psychobabble, the seemingly endless stream of esoteric talk that no one really understands. My hope for you is to end this class feeling better, feeling lighter, feeling powerful. I hope no one finishes this video saying what one old man said when he left church. He said, gee, that preacher must be smart because I didn't understand a thing he said. In the science of mind, we want to approach this thing called life simply, quietly, with a childlike innocence and amazement. As we open to more, more will come to us. Greater prosperity, better health, loving relationships, and perfect self-expression. The universe always has and always will give us exactly as much as we are willing to accept. If we are not receiving something, it's because we aren't open to accepting it on some level. The answers to our request are always yes. The real question is, how much of this reality are we going to express in our own lives? Think of walking down to the ocean shore to take back some seawater. It doesn't matter why you want to take the seawater. Just stay with me on this, okay? You're down at the shore. You want to take some seawater back to the, the house for whatever reason, okay? The ocean doesn't care how much water you take from her any more than God cares how much good we let into our lives. We can come to get the water with a bucket, a thimble, or a dump truck, but the choice is ours. Holmes tells us that the laws of nature are set and immutable, which means unchangeable. But the spontaneous recognition of these laws gives us the power to bring them into practical use in everyday life and experience. When was the last time you did something truly spontaneous? Maybe that could be our assignment for this week. Do something completely spontaneous for the absolutely no reason at all, other than you decided to do it. Let's call it divine whim. That's what spontaneous means. It just happens. Some of us get so organized that there is probably someone else like me out there who's already planning to do something spontaneous. But let go of that pressure to plan and just allow life to present an opportunity or opportunities for you this week to fully express life. If you put that thought out there and believe it, those opportunities will arise. That's the way the law works. A conscious action and an <laughs> inevitable, there's the word, a conscious action and an inevitable, <laughs> I still can't say it. One more time, a conscious action and an inevitable reaction to our conscious thought. Yes, that's what it is. Life always becomes to us the particular thing we need when we believe that it becomes to us that particular thing. The understanding of this is how the is, is the essence of simplicity. Yet what do we say? But how does it work? You can't just expect life to react that way. Why, look how hard I work all of my life. Well, one way to do it is meditate, or at least take time to be quiet. A colleague of mine says, God can't talk to us when we're noisy. Our mental work is definite, and it is work. What it does, what God does through us, can only come when we are receptive to it. We wouldn't think of planting seeds without tilling a soil. Yet, we may say a quick prayer or a canned prayer or a trite affirmation or do a half-hearted treatment while we are doing several things, other things at the same time, and then expect everything to be wonderful without ever lifting an ounce of our thinking out of the victim consciousness that we have spent so much of our time and energy developing to what we call our story. We all have our stories. You may think it's the truth 
or just what happened. But if there is some event that keeps you from moving forward or wallowing in the past, then it's a story. I can tell you when something becomes a story in my life. I start to complain to someone and immediately become bo bored before I've gotten halfway through the litany of my problem. If there is something in your story that you are doing or saying and you're boring yourself, it's definitely a story. Spiritual mind treatment is the form of affirmative scientific prayer that we use in religious science. It doesn't do something to us or for us that we can't envision. In treatment, we must become consciously aware of that which we wish to demonstrate in our lives. There's no occult trick to doing spiritual mind treatments. As I'm preparing this series of talks, I'm also writing and giving a free six-week class on spiritual mind treatment. The class is closed at the moment, but if you're not enrolled right now, it will be available online on my YouTube channel after February of 2024. We are learning various forms of treatment. There isn't one right or wrong way to do it, but whatever way we choose must generate a feeling within us of calm assurance that our desires are fulfilled. Rather than being something mysterious, treatment is just the reverse. Simplicity should mark our every effort. My longest treatments are not necessarily any more effective than the shorter ones. It just means I had to spend more time convincing myself of the truth, which also means I had more false evidence about the situation actually being real that I build up. As Holmes taught, a treatment is a statement in the law, embodying the concrete idea of our desires and accompanied by an unqualified faith that the law works for us as we work with it. Anybody can treat. In fact, everyone listening to this video is doing treatment all the time. Everyone, even if you've never heard of spiritual mind treatment. That's because a treatment always doesn't always have to be a specific three, five, six, or seven step affirmative prayer that I teach. Most of the time, our treatments take the form of the mind chatter that is going on inside our heads. The what ifs, the if onlys, the I should haves, and the assumptions we make about others. If our lives feel out of control, it is because we have not focused our thoughts. Trained thoughts are far more powerful than untrained. And the one who gives conscious power to their thoughts should be more careful about what they think than one who does not. That's one of the many famous quotes from Holmes that I absolutely love. Let me read that for you again. Trained thoughts are far more powerful than untrained. And the one who gives conscious power to their thought should be more careful about what they think than the one who does not. If God is all there is, and all there is is God, or spirit, or universal mind, or whatever you're going to call it, then none of us have any more power than the next person. But people who are unaware of their access to this power are creating their lives pretty much from subconscious or subjective thought. Once you learn this principle, you have knowledge to use this power both subconsciously and consciously. The thoughts you consciously think suddenly take shape more easily. The worries will still manifest at times, but so will all your most cherished desires. Holmes assures us that the more power one gives to their thought, the more completely they believe that their thought has power, the more power it will have. Treatment is an active thing. It is not sitting around hoping something will happen. We are definitely constructively, actively stating, sensing, and knowing some specific good. Passive meditation will never produce an active demonstration any more than an artist can paint a picture by sitting down with their paints and never picking up the brush. We confuse passive with receptive. If we are passive, we allow things to happen to us. But if we are receptive, we are actively inviting our good to happen. Just like the artist must know what she wants to paint, we must be able to mentally conceive that which we wish to demonstrate. Sometimes people want things that they've never seen. 
I can't remember how many times I've heard a pe person say, I want you to treat for a Rolls Royce, even though they've never been inside one, let alone drive one. You know, a Rolls isn't easy to park. It gets about eight gallons of gas to the mile. The wood interiors require constant attention. Even the sterling silver demands regular polishing. It wouldn't be so bad if you had hired help, but that's a whole nother level of acceptance and consciousness. The thing is, it's never the Rolls Royce or any other thing. It can look like the Rolls because the car screams prosperity, abundance, freedom, and the power to most people. So we begin to treating for the thing, don't get it because we haven't embodied the feeling completely, and then think that God is withholding from us. This is not the case. God doesn't withhold anything from any of us, but we must do our part in the process. Not mentally conceiving of what we want is like trying to bake a heart-shaped cake for Valentine's Day using a bun pan. Our intentions may be good, but that doesn't make the cake come out in the shape of a heart. Holmes wrote, therefore, if you are seeking to demonstrate, you must tell yourself that the faith in your power, in your ability, in the principle, and in the certainty of the demonstration for which you work. There is no mystery in truth. However, we must have faith in the truth. This faith, faith must not be confused with hope. For example, there have been many, many times when I've finished a, a treatment for a climate, client, and a damn good one, I might say, because I've been doing this for over 30 years, and I know what I'm doing. And then, as they're leaving my home, the person says, with a heavy sigh, well, I certainly hope it works. Seriously? We must do more than merely hope. There's another one of my favorite quotes from Holmes, the emphasize and facial expressions are mine, however, but here's what it is. Hope is good. It's better than despair, but it's a subtle illusion of an unconscious compromise, and it has no part in effective mental treatment. Does that sound severe for treatment or prayers? Well, take at the same look at the take a same yeah, take a look at the same attitude from another standpoint. You're about to have surgery, and your doctor comes in the room just as you're starting to fall into the effects of the anesthesia. And she says, I'm sure you'll be fine. I just hope I remember how to do the surgery. It's been a while. She's a professional. She should know what she's doing. If she is unsure how to proceed, then she ought to get the assistance from somebody who can do the job. You should feel the same way about the mental process of the treatment you do or the way you feel about the professional practitioner of spiritual mind treatment that you have employed to do the work. Expect the same level of professionalism, expertise, and confidence from your practitioner as you do from your doctor, your attorney, or your dentist. But also expect it within yourself for you are the only practitioner that will ever be with you 24 hours a day. In conclusion, we've seen what this principle is and how it works, and now this is what it does. We must acknowledge our doubts, our fears, but we must not let them ruin our lives or allow them to take our lives off vision and goals. Turn to any doubt in your mind and see the falsehood of that doubt. Or be willing to acknowledge the issues that the doubt brings up and deal with them to the best of your ability. The principle we have to demonstrate is perfect, and to the extent that we can convince ourselves that perfection, to that extent, you will automatically demonstrate. Don't waste your time, time arguing possibility or reliability with those who doubt the power of prayer or have no faith in the power of God mind. I have the faith that my treatments work because I proved it over and over and over and over again since I first heard my first science of mind lecture. It is said that you cannot prove faith to one that has none, nor deny it to one who bases their life on it. And I believe that to be true. So let the doubters doubt all they want. Let them doubt their magnificence and leave them wondering why they don't have what they say they want in their own lives. You can't have a relationship with someone's potential. So let them live their lives as they see fit because they, just like you, are already doing the very best they can right now with what they have to work with. 
If anything is to prove to them, they must prove it to themselves. Don't waste your time trying to prove anything to anyone, except, of course, yourself. Simply love the people who you see struggling and go about your life proving the principles. Be busy about the work of the Lord, as Scripture tells us, by doing whatever it is to build your own faith in this power. When you think a thought, something happens. If not in front of your eyes, then somewhere in your world. If the thought is not in favor of life, then the manifestations show up as our aches, pains, disease, lack, and loneliness. You are on a glorious path of self-discovery and wonder. But because you are taking charge of your life, there, there is a warning. You cannot afford the luxury of a negative thought. Be vigilant with your thoughts. Believe in this power which is at your disposal. How much of this infinite power is yours? All of it. How much of it may we have for our use? As much as we can embody. Be willing this week to open up to just a fraction more of this power, or as much as you want. And then, let universal law show off for you in your life and embrace all the good which is already yours. I hope you'll enjoy me. Enjoy me. <laughs> oh, my mouth has not been working on this video, and I am not going to take the time to record it again because... That's just me. This is what you get, warts and all. I hope you'll enjoy me. Join me. I hope you'll join me for the final part of our series when we continue our discussion with the talk entitled, How to Use It. There are countless ways that you could have spent the last few minutes of your day besides listening to me. You chose to listen to this video I am honored and somewhat surprised for some of you that you chose to spend it with me, but I'm glad you did. Until next time, all the best to you, always. Take care. <laughs>